Holy God, let my words be your words, and when my words are not your words, let your people be wise enough to know the same. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if the mask wasn't a dead giveaway, uh, my family and I have been suffering through COVID this week. Um, it meant that VBS was, uh, was something I got to enjoy for two days, but then I got pulled away from our 51 kids that were here this week, which was such a wonderful thing. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm not going to wear my mask while I'm preaching, so hopefully I'm still far enough away from y'all, um, but I will wear it uh, when I am administering communion and getting close to y'all. So earlier this summer, I got to be a big camper at Camp McDowell. I was not alone. I had my elder child, Teddy, as my bunkmate, and we had a blast. I was reminded why time at camp is really the best. Through Teddy's first experience at McDowell, I could see through his eyes such joy, making new friends, singing songs, having a pasture party, swimming in the pool, and being in the woods. There was one block of time, though, that was a challenge. This period reminded me of how much I did not like this hour when I was a child, a wee little camper myself. Back then, I despised this time more than any other. No, it wasn't swim tests, nor was it dancing with yucky girls who had cooties. I mean, even as an awkward, pimply tween, I liked to dance. I even liked the minimal air conditioning, the time away from TV, and the rustic restroom. Okay, maybe I didn't like the rustic restrooms, but the time I could not stand, I could not tolerate, I could not abide was none other than rest time. Ugh. You may think that I'm a calm, laid back, contemplative person. And as your pastor, I really do strive to be a non-anxious presence. But deep down, I'm like a duck. On the surface, I look like I'm just floating along, but underneath, I'm going like this all the time. Something churning and moving. There's so much activity underneath the surface. So as a camper, to ask me to nap or be quiet or even sit still on my bed for just a little bit of time, well, that was the greatest agony. Why, yes, I did have a cushy childhood. Why do you ask? Still, I did not learn the great joy of napping or resting or relaxing until much later. Even now, I love restoration, but I'm not very good at it. But I don't think I'm alone. We as a cannot calm down. Even back during pandemic time, when much of the world slowed down, there were many people that were going and going and going such that they were burning themselves out. This tells me that we are not good at resting. As someone once told me, I don't do nothing well. And all poor grammar set aside, we don't do nothing well. We are bad at sitting still. We are like campers who have been loaded up with sugar and told to sit down on their beds during rest time. So what do we do when Jesus invites us to come away to a deserted place and rest a while? How do we slow down enough even to hear Jesus' invitation? Can we utilize Sabbath time or moments of respite wisely? In the church, we often talk about stewardship of money or resources or even volunteering opportunities. As important as our stewardship of these gifts is, so is the stewardship of our time. As we enter this last little bit of summer vacation, time away from school, I wonder how can we be good stewards of our times of leisure? I wrote about this last month in Happenings, but on the surface, the phrase stewardship of leisure sounds silly. For leisure is spare time, time off, or free time used for our refreshment. Why not let it just be spontaneous? Why worry about free time? Doesn't that sort of structure defeat the whole purpose? Well, to answer these questions, think about some free time or a vacation that felt unfulfilling. Maybe you came back more tired than when you left. 
When we do not use our downtime effectively, it's akin to spending important monetary funds on something that you do not need, that does not bring lasting joy, or does not serve a larger purpose. Sadly, I've experienced a few retreats and vacations that depleted me instead of recharging me. Those unsatisfying moments of leisure were such because I did not think from the perspective of being a good steward. I was not thankful for what God was giving me. In other words, I did not recognize that my time away was a gift from God. I was a bad steward of that time. To listen to Jesus' call to come away with him to a quiet place of refreshment is not about having the perfect plan. For that sort of overscheduling can in and of itself defeat the work of the Spirit to create new spirits in us. <coughs> so, what does being a good steward of leisure time or time in general look like? Well, what does today's good news tell us? As you might have noticed, there's a big hole in the middle of our gospel account. Verses 32, 35 through 52 are completely missing. And in that is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, don't worry. Over the next five Sundays, we will hear way too much about Jesus and bread to make up for this week's missing morsels. You're going to hear so much about Jesus and the bread of life that you're going to want to become gluten-free. Today, it's important to see how Jesus' invitation to come away to a deserted place did not turn out exactly as we might expect. Jesus invited the apostles to rest a while, and yet that time of respite was cut short as the Spirit intervened in the way of many tired souls seeking sustenance. They descended upon Jesus and his friends as soon as these protagonists reached the shore. This onslaught of people meant that the disciples had no leisure time. They didn't even have time to eat. Tired and hungry from their own missionary work, the disciples may have even been looking forward to a little rest and relaxation. Instead, they were tasked with helping Jesus feed the masses. It was as though a feeding ministry broke out in the middle of their retreat center. The time that God had given the disciples to rest was now time when God was asking them to work. Can anyone here relate to life throwing something unexpected your way? Probably not, right? Just kidding. Maybe all of us can think of times during the last several years when we thought one thing would happen, but something else entirely came to be. Parents who were initially excited to have children at home only to recognize that teachers do not get paid nearly enough. College students or workers who rejoice at not having to get out of bed for class or meetings only to realize that Zoom meetings and class can be even worse than the in-person versions. Recent retirees who looked forward to travel but then faced isolation and staying at home to avoid getting sick. There are countless ways in which one thing was expected, but another thing came to be. A seminary professor I had said on the first day of class, expectations are resentments waiting to happen. Expectations are resentments waiting to happen. So what do we do when life surprises us? Are we never to rest? Are we to give until we are burnt out, broke, and bone tired? Perhaps the fruit of this passage grows from an exploration of the way we see not only free time, but all of time. Maybe you have heard of the practice of a rule of life, or as our outgoing presiding bishop likes to call it, a way of love. The purpose of this way is to find everyday practices that encourage and challenge us to give our first fruits to God, to give our best time to forming habits that nourish our relationships with Christ, when you thrive in your way of love, when you dedicate yourself to a framework that grows your relationship with God and neighbor, then all time, every bit of your time is transformed. This isn't always easy to remember though. During seminary, I often felt like I had too much to do. Papers to write, exams to study for, field work to complete. Sometimes I would just do the bare minimum. I would only go to the one required chapel service each day, but I shirked a second or third opportunity to spend time with God and fellow students. One day I was walking back from class with a friend. 
and he began to turn towards the chapel, and I began to walk on towards my apartment so that I could go do some work. I said, I went to morning prayer already. I don't have time to go to the Eucharist today. He responded humbly, I don't know what I have time to do until I go to chapel. Afterward, my priorities become clearer. After a deep exhale, <laughs> I turned from going to work on my paper and back towards chapel. Maybe in that moment I felt guilty. Like one of the disciples who wanted to rest and not deal with those hungry thousands. Slowly though, I've realized how wise my friend's words were. Every moment of every day, God gifts us with the present. Each new day overflows with opportunities to grow our relationship with God and with one another. We need times of Sabbath, restoration, and healing, or else we will not be able to sustain our personal and collective ministries. And whether it is free time or work time, family time or personal time, prayer time or other time, God gives us each second, minute, hour, day, week, month, year, lifetime, all of it is a gift, regardless of what type of time we think it is. At all times and in all places, we are called to give thanks to God for the present that we receive. Some of those moments will be Jesus calling us away to a deserted place to rest a while. And other moments will be times to forget our needs and serve those who are without. If we continue to give our best moments to God, we will discover something amazing. Like how God transforms the bread and wine that we put on the altar each week into our Eucharistic sacraments, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. And like how God transforms the monetary gifts we bring to the altar as symbols of ourselves into the ministries of healing and blessing in this world. When we give our time to God, God transforms it and God changes it, giving it back to us blessed. Each nanosecond we receive from God is already a gift. God beckons us to give each moment back so that it may be blessed and sanctified, like how a child might receive markers and paper from a parent, but what they give back is pure gift for that guardian. At all moments are gifts. Can you recognize them as such and then give them back to God? This will be easy during a calm moment with Christ, but what about when the would-be tranquil times are interrupted by a chance for ministering to another. Even then, this moment is a gift. When we recognize that all time is gift, it is easy to give the present back to God. Amen.